Next up, we have Ben Cerveny, designer of the game that became Flickr, formerly director of experience, of experience design at Frog, founder of Verb, a nonprofit exploring computa computation in the urban space, and co-founder of Team, a software design studio producing tools for understanding and expression. Welcome, Ben. Um, hi, I'm Ben Cerveny. Uh, sorry for the uh, confusion with the slides earlier, but um, I'm, it's kind of interesting the way these, these presentations have played out because we're sort of, I feel like we're moving down the chain from direct experience through kind of a middle layer of understanding what the geolocative services are about to where I'm going, which is actually a much more kind of broad um, kind of inquiry into what it means to be looking at um, space in a new way, because right now we're sort of, my, my concept of AR is a little bit different, you know, coming from a somewhat of a product design and, and web services design background, uh, less about this idea, you know, AR for I think a lot of people, especially now in the era of, of Google Glass is about, is about this kind of projection of data onto the environment through personal devices. Um, but for me, augmented reality has always existed in the welling up of information into things in our environment that we see ambiently that uh, as we move through might be dynamically provisioned with data for us. So, you know, aug the augmentation of reality, I think, may be ultimately less about um, a personal kind of uh, personal area network view that's being projected onto, onto space, but instead more about this kind of consensual experience of uh, data moving through the built environment uh, and sort of serving us in that way. Uh, so, um, you know, as these objects become more interconnected and as sort of this Internet of Things spreads the network into, you know, sort of pervasive circumstance where it's uh, kind of motivating all of the things that we interact with on a daily basis, um, you know, part of what part of what makes those objects form a sort of coherent experience around us is their uh, collective understanding of space. How are they positioned in space? How are we positioned in space relative to them? And how do we build a scene in which all of us are participating and can sort of uh, collectively experience uh, a new layer on top of that? So, you know, we've had historically the idea of spatial description has been like a huge project. I mean, that in, in a lot of ways, part of what made civilization to begin with was the idea of collectively understanding space. The idea of a town, the idea of uh, a public uh, is actually, you know, kind of a, a, an inscription uh, by people together of the idea of space. And so, you know, um, certainly in the eras of exploration, the uh, map making uh, became the, an incredible technology that was actually the technology that allowed for the idea of colonization, the idea of expansion into, into explorable territories. Uh, those things were opened up by the fact that we all had consensual models of where we might be. Um, and so now the thing that's interesting about what's happening, you know, for us in our concept of space is not so much about modeling spaces that we don't really know yet in order to get there. Instead, it's about modeling spaces that we know quite well in order to layer them with activity and possibility. <clears throat> so, you know, there, right now we're sort of, there are two different, you know, inroads into the description of space that we've pursued, you know, culturally uh, over, over hundreds of years. So, you know, the first, the first thing that we do is we make these maps. We make, you know, you know, visual recordings of the relationships of things in space. And so, you know, we're seeing in the last decade, uh, especially, an incredible acceleration of this capability based on a couple of things. One, you know, this sort of concept of big data that people have been talking about, the idea that, uh, that you know, players like Google and Esri and um, Apple have been, you know, really kind of accreting tons and tons of information on the idea uh, on you know this this uh, the map you know the idea that we can build together like open street map the idea that we can build together a representation of space is incredibly empowering we have these you know sort of crowdsourcing technologies that allow us to all go together into spaces that we you know can describe collectively and build huge models that we can then use in our enterprise so that's that's you know you know, sort of phase one of the understanding of space. And then I'd say probably the most compelling understanding of space that we have is our ability to tell stories about it. So what does it mean to have subjectivity in space and to understand what, you know, the interactions therein are over time? You know, how do you, what is a space for uh, from a, 
an individual human perspective, what is the experience of lived space as opposed to a top-down view like a map represents. So, you know, there are tons of examples, obviously, you know, narratives, Marco Polo being, you know, kind of this almost archetypal way that, you know, he brought back tales of faraway places. And before the maps were formed, there was still this understanding of possibility of, what, of a where, you know, what, where might you go and what might you do there? What is the experience like? What are the sensations? You know, this is, a, this is a way that we transfer the subjectivity of localization between people. We tell the story of a place. And so, you know, the thing that's really interesting about those two things is that one of them is very much a top-down projection. The map is an, is an abstraction, is, a, is an objectification of place. Uh, in a way that allows us to systematize it and to understand the relationships therein. And the spoken world is a, is a situation. It's, a, it's an, a wash of experiences, a wash of uh, meaning in, in a very philosophical and, you know, and sort of subjective sense. And so how do we rationalize those two approaches to understanding space? And this, to me, is part of what undergirds you know, all of these kind of more device-oriented you know, windows that we might have into space. We talk a lot in, in the AR industry about you know, what, are the, what are the actual technologies that allow us to interact with that model that's, you know, that represents the space, but really, you know, all of those things are pointing back towards these, you know, these underlying technologies, which are the, the, the back end, uh, you know, as we say in technology development, of what is the actual model of the space. And I think that's actually, you know, before we descend too much into the fetishization of the objects that allow us to access that model, I think it's really important for us to consider what what is actually bubbling underneath that? What is it that we're accessing? You know, what, what, is, what is there there? You know, is there a there there? And how do you, how many quotation marks are around it? And whose quotation marks are they? Um, so, you know, really what, you know, what, we, what we're sort of coming up against is this, is this recognition that the process that we're engaged in as a culture in terms of location-based technology is this accretion of ontologies, an accretion of meanings on top of places and objects in those places and the people that occupy those places. And so, you know, I think really the thing that, the thing that is probably the most uh, precious resource as we go into this are these ontologies, this, uh, this, this set of meanings, you know, that allow us to sort of operationalize a space, to sort of understand how we relate to it uh, as individuals and groups. And so, you know, um, if, if you imagine um, that a space is potentially, you know, viewable in, you know, thousands of different contexts and thousands of different kind of application paths and, uh, you know, social networks and, you know, all of those things are facets of a, of a, you know, kind of a platonic ideal object. If there's something, a noun like a computer on the table, that computer is almost, you know, emanating all of these different potential meanings in terms of its situation in your sort of path through that space. And so uh, it's really important to try and understand or try and imagine what the technological back end that would support that type of, you know, uh, layering of meanings on top of objects is. Um, so, in you know, historically we have we have some pretty interesting precedents for this. There's a huge, you know, uh, as usual, gaming seems to sneak in often as kind of a prototyping environment for what happens in later sort of um, rounds of technological development. And one of the one of the simplest and most poetic kind of approaches to the understanding of space uh, uh, came about, you know, sort of from the legacy of these Infocom games that people may remember from a long time ago, things like Zork and, uh, you know, that were, that were these um, text-based games that gave you a little prompt and told you, you know, there is a lamp here. Oh, I look at the lamp. Okay, the lamp uh, has these characteristics. And the thing that was interesting about that is that that was, you know, really in some ways a primary narrative engine to understand a model of space. And so, you know, as that evolved, uh, at, you know, on computer networks, early, early, uh, text-based adventures uh, were called MOOs and MUDs. MUDs were multi-user dungeons and MOOs were kind of the object-oriented evolution of those. Um, and one of the people that ran one of the most successful MOOs at, at Park actually was named Pavel Curtis. Uh, and he actually went so far as to imagine that these narrative operating systems where people were sort of building themselves narrative spaces, you know, they could use tools like uh, to, 
craft themselves rooms and put objects in those rooms, and those objects would have verbs on them, and people could come into the room you know, using these sort of command line navigation tools and investigate, interrogate the objects, understand what their sort of, you know, the verbs attached to them were, and work with them in a narrative way. You know, a lot of times these involved, you know, sort of Dungeons and Dragons metaphors, but ultimately a lot of the most popular moves were more about creating social spaces, things like cafes and places where people could hang out together and use and use objects as kind of reference points to understand each other. Uh, and so, in 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 Pavel Curtis's kind of ultimate uh, kind of uh, realization of this, he was hoping that eventually, you know, at the time this was. Some of, the, some of these technologies were being developed around the same time as the graphical user interface for computers themselves. And so there was this, you know, it's funny now we think in some ways that the GUI is a canonical way to relate to the operating system. We're very visually oriented culture. So the idea that you would have a visual metaphor that guided you into, the, into interactions with computational processes seemed really uh, like it was a no-brainer. But really, now that we've moved back into these, you know, this era of potential invisibility of interfaces, it's actually the semantics of those interactions rather than the visual representation of those interactions which becomes really powerful. And so in order to represent those semantics, sometimes a narrative telling is actually a much more, a much more you know, sort of convenient way to locate that. So, Pavel, you know, Pavel's question was, was there a way that we could make a collaboratively narrative representation of the operating system? And I think that, you know, to a certain degree, we're coming back around to that realization that there is, you know, that in AR, we need to have narrative ways of describing handles on all the objects that we want to interact with on this kind of operational layer. So how is it that we're going to, you know, build those spaces together? <clears throat> and of course, you know, again from gaming, uh, as, that, as that evolved, uh, we moved sort of you know, from from the idea of the moo and the mud, you know, to things like WoW and EverQuest and you know, really huge services that were actually allowing massive numbers of people to participate simultaneously in a shared model. In this case, of course, a virtual game world. But the thing that was interesting about it was that these shared models actually could support all of these people uh, operating them at the same time. You know, the idea that that you could have a representation of a place that had you know hundreds of people in it, and all of those people would have a shared representation of what was happening on the objects in the space. You know, so uh, part of what, when we began the adventure that ultimately became Flickr, we started off designing something called The Game Never Ending, which was a massively multiplayer online game based in Flash on the web. It's a little bit of a, you know, uh, dated concept now, but part of what we were trying to, uh, trying to explore was, you know, the possibility that there could be you know, a collaboratively creative way to describe network resources. At the time, we weren't really thinking so much about AR, but we were thinking about everyone's experience online. This was kind of the age of, of blogging and the early kind of uh, meta filter, you know, style kind of social contexts on the web. And so, you know, we thought, well, maybe there's a narrative way to describe that interaction. Maybe there's a way you can bring people in together into a space where they're collaborating in real time and constructing shared models of how they're interacting with the internet. So, you know, the, the interesting thing about that, though, is that we started to build the tools that allowed people to bring aspects of their real life in, uh, into this narrative environment. You know, Flickr was something that evolved out of some projects we did thinking about, you know, what happens if people can be creative around photography in this, in this shared space. And so, you know, I think that was just the beginning of a huge cascade of uh, interactions, you know, ways of touching down from these collaborative uh, online spaces that happened in real time uh, and beginning to knit them into their sort of ground them in the actual world. And so, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot more room for evolution of these kind of real time models, but the idea that at some point there will be a type of service which is a massively multi participant model of real space in which you know, all of these types of mediation are collected in real time and, and targeted on the objects that uh, represent them in this virtual layer. And also, you know, sort of the verbs you know, on those objects are extended out to people. You know, the idea that there are all APIs resident on these objects in space that then can be you know, made available to spatialized applications that can knit them together into things that operate, uh, operate a space by its op by its partic uh, sort of participant occupants, that's you know these are the types of things that we have to start considering what the implications of that are. And so I'd say you know some of the different architectural 
ways in which this could be accomplished all have incredibly different sort of political ramifications and sort of, you know, ethical ramifications and technical ramifications. Obviously, you know, one of the things that we're experiencing most because they're, they're making the, the lion's share of the R&D expenditures right now is the idea of commercial data projection onto these spaces. So obviously Google Glass is the beginning of an ability, uh, you know, for giant multinational corporations to keep the data about the spaces and then project it back for you and sort of manage your understanding of the space. And of course, get, this gives you, you know, a kind of view onto reality that's been filtered by you know, uh, incumbent, incumbent concerns. People, you know, obviously there's advertising, you know, there's this idea that there might be a ranking system that comes from, from uh, somewhere else. Uh, now, it's also possible that, that you know, as, as the, the need for these services grows, the need to have a spatial representation of a place grows, that obviously the people that maintain those places governmentally may feel like they have a stake in that, in that you know, sort of action. Of course, right now we accept the idea that a transit system is part of public infrastructure that a city might provide, but obviously this idea of a spatial information system is also something that might be considered part of the public sphere, the idea that there is a representation that everyone shares and contributes to about space. Uh, and now that's something that I think a lot of policy people are beginning to recognize as something that's really important to pursue. Uh, and then of course, you know, a lot of what uh, technology has evolved as the most kind of um, adaptive and fast evolving models of these types of infrastructural systems involve peer-to-peer uh, services that are operated by individuals or small groups. So the idea that a web server was the kind of atomic unit that, you know, uh, from which the internet was born. Of course, now we've seen incumbents begin to sort of aggregate around those services, and now we have a lot, a little bit more of an asymmetric model. But the idea that there could be a spatial service that's operated on the scale of a building or a room or, you know, a personal network in a social way or a cafe commercial concern on a small level, you know, those I think are also kind of the ways in which we're going to start to see uh, augmented reality hardware attached to the network. So, you know, what is it that lives on the back end? There are many different kind of architectural models to explore, but I think all of them have their own politics, all of them have their own technological implications, all of them have their own kind of, you know, uh, possibility space for what, you know, how we're going to start mapping the grammar of being in the world on a technical level. You know, what does it mean to connect nouns and verbs into applications that we actually use to experience together and operate our environments in AR. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.